It's a real pleasure to be here and hopefully um, after last night we'll start off with a bit of good news for our host country. Sorry, sorry about the match. That wasn't good. That wasn't good. Anyway, I think, I think the big thing with any talk is to start off on a positive note and let's just talk about the fantastic advances that we have had um, in medicine. So we've had an exponential increase in population. Extraordinary when you think about it, the population of the world in 1800 was about 1 billion and it's now 8 billion. We have more success in the area of keeping people alive now than ever before. And it started off with things like improved sanitation and improved perinatal care, antibiotics, vaccination programs, and huge advances in technology and ways of, of preventing and reducing disease. 2020 was mentioned yesterday by Professor Stringham as being really important from the point of view of eye disease. But with population growth, it's really a landmark year as well. So for the first time in 2020, we will have more people aged over 65 than less than aged five. And that's remarkable. And that's expected to increase exponentially. So by 2050, about 20% or 17 to 20% of our population will be aged over 65. So we're getting people to live longer. So what's the challenge? The challenge is you mustn't just live longer, you must live better. And that's what we really want to do. And these figures at the bottom here just reflect that. So I qualified as a doctor in 1990. And it wasn't all that common to have people in their 90s and late 90s in your, in your waiting room. Now it's common practice. People in my waiting room are in their late 80s and 90s and so they are living much longer. But coupled with this increase in, in longevity and people living longer, we have a lot more age-related diseases. And age-related diseases really happen when cells stop working in the way they were meant to work in the first place. So over time, these cells are getting tired. So we also have, unfortunately, a bit of bad news with an exponential increase in dementia. Thank you, pardon. So dementia is an umbrella term that we use for a group of disorders that are, are associated with cognitive impairment. And there is an exponential explosion in the number of cases of dementia worldwide. So these figures are taken from the 2015 World Health Report on dementia. And in 2015 alone, there was about a 9.9 .9 million increase in the number of people on this earth with dementia. There's a new case about every three seconds. So while you're going to be sitting here listening to me, if I speak for about 25 minutes, we'll have 500 new cases of dementia worldwide. There's about 50 million cases of dementia in the world right now, and that's expected to double every 20 years. So as you can see here, 75 million or so in 2030, 131 million in 2050. So we must, we simply must take it seriously. So dementia, as I say, is an umbrella term, and by far the most common cause of dementia is Alzheimer's disease. And we'll talk, this talk is, is predominantly focused on Alzheimer's disease. And other common causes are vascular. And in fact, sometimes it's quite difficult to separate these in that the risk factors for vascular dementia and Alzheimer's disease are quite alike. And then we've other causes as well. So what is Alzheimer's disease? What is it? So it's a progressive neurodegenerative condition. So we'll talk about neurodegeneration in a moment, but this condition is progressive. And it pre presents with progressive difficulties with short-term memory. So remembering what happened this morning or what you had for breakfast or forgetting last night might be a good thing. But so progressive difficulty with short-term memory. But it's more than that, and that's the important thing. It's a global disorder. It also affects your ability to carry out your everyday activities. So things like it might start with doing the groceries or a bill coming in and just not being able to figure, well, what am, I, what am I supposed to do with that? And getting very agitated about things that you did in your sleep before. You really did very simply. And then changes in behavior, maybe more agitated, more cross, sleep disturbance. So these behavioral um, changes as well and a gradual feeling of loss of self. And I think that's really important because at the, I, so I'm a clinician and I know I'm in the presence of fantastic scientists, which is always humbling. But what I want to know is how does this affect the person sitting in front of me? And the way it affects them is they begin to lose their sense of self because they, they, they just can't remember what happened this morning. They can remember what happened 20 years ago. And things that around the house, managing themselves, managing getting dressed, washed, managing themselves become much more difficult. And what's the scale of that problem? Well, let's just talk about the UK. In the UK alone, there's over a half a million people right now with Alzheimer's disease. 
and the cost is, they say, 27 billion. But of course, that's the cost, the healthcare cost that they measure. What they don't measure is the cost of informal care and carers. And, and we do report that for every one person with Alzheimer's disease, there's at least three family members affected. And I'm not too sure how many people here know somebody with Alzheimer's disease, but it's a family illness. It really does affect families. So I'm delighted that we, have, we are concentrating now on maybe ways to delay onset or reduce the impact of this huge disease, because right now it's relentless and it's progressive, and we don't have, you know, we don't have in our armatorium right now the medications that we've been using to date at best maybe make things better for a short amount of time. So that's what Alzheimer's is. And what are the risk factors for Alzheimer's disease? Well, we started off by saying how great it is that everybody's living longer, and probably the greatest risk for Alzheimer's disease is age. So for aged over 65, maybe 5 to 8% or so of the population of Alzheimer's disease, but aged over 85, up to 50% of the population have Alzheimer's disease. So it really is extraordinarily common. It's more common in females, mainly because we live longer for whatever reason. And then obviously there's the other non-modifiable things. Your, there's your genetic history. So, you know, particularly for young onset, onset Alzheimer's disease, your genetics is particularly important. But things like your apoprotein type. So if you're homozygous for apoprotein E4, you have a higher risk for Alzheimer's disease. If you're homozygous for E2, you have a lower risk. Um, other things like um, trisomy 21 or other genetic conditions such as Downs, there's a hugely increased risk of Alzheimer's disease. We talk about index head injuries. When I'm talking to people in my clinic, I'll often go back to, well, tell me about your childhood. And, and sometimes there will be a very significant head injury at somewhere along the way, and that certainly increases the risk of Alzheimer's disease. Lifestyle. So smoking and alcohol, we, we heard very eloquently yesterday how smoking and alcohol can affect your carotenoid and your antioxidant activity. But smoking and alcohol and things like cannabis and other illicit drugs certainly increase the risk of Alzheimer's disease as you get older. Obesity, we no longer talk about what obesity can do because obesity causes everything. It causes arthritis, it causes cancer, it causes depression, it causes social isolation and it hugely increases the risk of Alzheimer's disease. So in the US right now, two out of three adults are overweight or obese, and that significantly increases the risk of Alzheimer's disease. And when we talk about vascular risk factors, think of the body as one blood vessel and the heart is the pump in the middle. So if there is something wrong with the blood vessel anywhere along the way, that increases your risk of Alzheimer's disease. So if you've had Stroke disease, now this may be predominantly vascular, but if you have um, evidence of TIAs, carotid disease, heart disease, kidney disease, peripheral vascular disease, and diabetes, because we always throw diabetes, they are all similarly risk factors for Alzheimer's disease, as well as vascular dementia. And that's why I said at times it can be quite difficult to separate the two. So these are your risk factors for Alzheimer's disease. And we have to now put in diet. I was fascinated yesterday by one of our speakers who talked about um, the young boy in his clinic who had no macular pigment and he didn't eat vegetables, full stop. So while we are eating more and getting heavier, the nutritional value of what we're eating unfortunately is going down and we must start taking that seriously. So let's talk for a minute about degeneration. There are many of the diseases that are causing problems right now are due to degeneration. So the cell stops working in the way that it was meant to in the first place. And neurodegeneration is where the brain cells stop working the way they were meant to do. So if we think of the brain as a little bit like a really complex electricity grid. So you have your wiring system, you have your connections, you have your chemicals in between, and electrical impulses flying all over the place. So just right now, as I'm talking to you, I hope I'm using my brain a lot. So I'm trying to remember to stand up straight, trying to remember what I'm going to say, trying to cast the odd smile out of the audience. And you are similarly using your brain, just sitting there looking at me. So the brain is hugely active. It's a fantastically complex system. But as a result, it has a very high oxygen demand. It is huge production of oxygen-free radicals. And it's something that is using all of the time. So at any one stage, things can go wrong in the system. So the wiring system can become a bit irregular. The impulse box is in the middle, so the electrical activity can, can go down. The junctions, so the transmitters at the junctions can become abnormal. And what's the problem? Everything starts to go down. And this, this, the risk of this increases significantly with age. 
So if you could imagine a scheme here where we're going along, but over time we've increased oxidative stress, increased inflammation, apologies, this is incorrect here, it should be increased protein production and reduced protein clearance. So our ability to get rid of the abnormal proteins actually goes down as we, as we get older. And then neurotransmitter imbalance. And what happens at the end of all of that? We get these huge insoluble proteins dumped into the middle of our electrical system and it stops the effective transfer of information from where it should be. So you get production of your amyloid plaque and neurofibrillary tangles. And what happens? The neurofibrillary tangles go in the wrong place. So they go bang in the middle of where you want information to go. And let's just look at it a little bit differently. Think of it like a motorway. So when the motorway is nice and clear and it's lovely when you hit a motorway and things are flying up and down the motorway the, the way it should be. And then put a big protein across the middle of it, it stops. So with Alzheimer's disease, our ability to encode and save new information becomes very impaired. And if you don't save it into the storage box of your brain in the first place, there's a lot of difficulty getting it out again. So that's what Alzheimer's disease. So I talked about the current drug treatments that are licensed for treatment of Alzheimer's disease. They've really been focused on neurotransmitter activity. So we have acetylcholinesterase inhibitors, which is one group of drugs, and probably the other female, our group of drugs is a drug called memantine, or an NMDA receptor antagonist, and it reduces levels of glutamate. So they specifically work at neurotransmitter activity. And they have some benefits in about 40% of people where they can slow things down for a little while or make people feel better. But an awful lot of work now, thankfully, is being done in the area of nutrition in the brain. And what can we do that's easier? What can we do to stop that wiring system degenerating in the first place? And let's talk about the parts of the brain that are important. So we've all heard of the, the hippocampus. It's been mentioned a few times over the last few days. And your precuneus and your amygdala, all those little bits in the brain that are really important for memory. And the frontal lobe and prefrontal lobe are particularly important. And it was really exciting when you see the collaboration of international research that has highlighted the parts of the brain where carotenoids are actually concentrated. And lo and behold, carotenoids, not only are they, are they in the eye, because there's been such eloquent work done in the eye for a long time with regards to carotenoids, but they're also very much in the frontal lobe and the prefrontal lobe, and these are parts of the brain that are important for memory. So as I talk about internationally, you really, it, it's when you, when you stand up presenting any research, it's not your research, you're on the back and on the coattails of international research. And there are fantastic people across here in this room who have contributed to the whole story of the Waterford story for some amount of time. I suppose starting back to Neil Craft in 2004 where he identified carotenoids in the brain, particularly in this prefrontal and frontal area. And then we have um, Joanne Feeney, and I know Joanne is here, it's my first time meeting her even though I talk about her all of the time. But Joanne found that carotenoids are positively related to cognitive performance in a large sample. So, we know that carotenoids, giving carotenoids to healthy people can improve their vision. We've had that for some time. And we also know that giving carotenoids to healthy people can improve their cognition. And then I suppose the big story is, well, that's in healthy people. If you start giving it to people with Alzheimer's disease, can you improve cognition? And that's where I, I very much became involved with John Nolan. And I came in on top of a fantastic research centre and attached on to this particular question, which is so important. So let's just talk a little bit about the Waterford papers. We'll start off um, with the Crest Cognition paper. And this looked at giving carotenoids to healthy individuals who had low macular pigment. So with low macular pigment, if you give them carotenoids, we do know from all of the work that's been done that you can improve their macular pigment levels, but could you improve cognition? And this study, so this was the, the objective of the study, and I'm very mindful of our previous speaker, so be clear on your objective, to investigate the impact of supplementation with lutein, zeaxanthine, and miozeaxanthine on memory, executive function, etc., um, among healthy individuals. It was a simple study. It was, you had to be 18 years, not taking any supplements of any sort, um, no cognitive issues, and it was a double-blind placebo-controlled trial. So fantastically, at the end of all of that, and, and there was some very eloquent work, and I know Rebecca, who's the um, first author on this paper, along with John, no John Nolan, did great work looking at specifically at cognition and ways of measuring episodic memory. So your episodic memory is the, is the here and now. What did you just look at? Can you remember what you've just done? 
And what were the hits? Well, first of all, obviously there was an increase in macular pigment. So this is in at, at time zero and then after supplementation. So you can see a clear increase in macular pigment volume. But in this one, these are the controls. So obviously they didn't have an increase. And here, these are the people with Alzheimer's disease and impaired associate learning is one of the tests that we do for episodic memory. And after 12 months with carotenoids, you can see that there was less errors. So there was a significant improvement in episodic memory in people who were taking the carotenoids and obviously no improvement in people uh, with Alzheimer's disease. So what's the bottom line here? So it showed a memory enhancing effect of carotenoids on healthy individual and, this, and also on their um, macular pigment levels. We then went on to, so this is where the story with Alzheimer's begins and we looked at, uh, took 30 subjects who had established Alzheimer's disease. So established disease that was proven in a clinical setting and we compared them to 30 age matched controls. And the first part of this study was looking at our baseline data. So we wanted to see, did people with Alzheimer's disease have they clearly had poorer cognition because they wouldn't be in the study otherwise. But what was the story with their macular pigment? And what was the story with their vision? And what was the story with their serum carotenoids? So really beautiful work because you could measure the serum and the eye and cognition. So now we're bringing in three areas. So the baseline data was absolutely fascinating. Well, I thought it was fascinating anyway, in that we found that people with Alzheimer's disease have significantly poorer vision. Now that does have an impact. People with Alzheimer's disease have many other things that impact them in their everyday activities. So things like falling, you know, having difficulty getting around the house. So poor vision has a clinical impact. So we, could, we found that people with Alzheimer's disease had poorer vision. And this was done using the, the, the very exotic spectralis techniques and I'm not going to even try, I can barely spell it, never mind know how to do it, but this was done. And obviously checking the serum levels using HPLC. So the bottom line in the, in the baseline data for this group of people with Alzheimer's disease versus control is that there was a relative lack of macular pigment in people with Alzheimer's disease. This corresponded with poorer vision in people with Alzheimer's disease and their serum carotenoid levels were also significantly lower. So we're after identifying a nutrient that we know is now lower in Alzheimer's disease and that sets the scene for going forward. So the next thing was, well, if you give these people carotenoids, what can you do? What can you help? And that's part two of the story where the people with, with, with Alzheimer's disease were given carotenoids and we wanted to see could we make everything better, could, had, could we save the world? And that's a, it's a good place to start. And there was, there was certainly improvements, but the, where the, sorry, that's the paper that was published on the, on the exploratory work. So in this group, again with Alzheimer's disease, so this great group of people who stayed in the study, we continued to measure their serum level of carotenoids, we continued to measure their vision and their cognition. And so what happened? What was the outcome of giving carotenoids to people with Alzheimer's disease? Well, the outcome was that we could significantly increase their macular, their, their macular pigment levels. I'm going to see where I am now. We could significantly improve their vision and their macular pigment volume. So we could get their serum carotenoids higher. We could get their vision better, and that's good, their contrast sensitivity. And we talked yesterday about vision simply not being, I was great to hear it, that it's not 2020 vision, it's what can you see? Can you see? I don't know, do you go into, do, do um, home visits occasionally? And grandchildren are fantastic. They give brilliant ornaments every year. And every ornament and rug is in that house. And there's usually low volume or low lighting bulbs as well. So if you can't see the ornament that's on the floor, it increased risk of falls. So it is significant back to, I'm all clinical, back to how does this help the person? It helps them by seeing what they couldn't see in the first place. But the bad news at this point was giving carotenoids to this group of people, carotenoids on their own, did not improve their cognition. And when we were talking about this in, in one of the research meetings in, in the Vision Research Centre, we were saying, well, the Alzheimer's is established. You know, the, the problem is established. We're too late. We're too late giving carotenoids at that point. So just to summarise again, so we were able to increase the macular pigment volume and improve vision. So yes, a really important finding, but, but like anything, you want more. And that's the paper that was published in the Journal of Alzheimer's Disease reporting that work. 
Around about this time, there was a paper published in Nature by Mark Mapstone, and he looked particularly at serum levels of phospholipids as a way of helping to diagnose Alzheimer's disease. And this was potentially exciting because could you take a blood test because a lot of, in, in my centre, we very much diagnose Alzheimer's disease on clinical story and clinical progression and carer reports, etc. But there are, are quite more invasive tests, lumbar punctures, which can look at specific um, findings in lumbar punctures to help increase your sensitivity and specificity in diagnosing Alzheimer's disease. And Mark Mapstone appears to come out with a blood test that may help. It may help. And then Dr. Alan Howard, who I know is in, in, the, in, in the audience, and Dr. Howard has a huge curiosity about everything. And it's one of the things that's great with science. But he said, well, is that right? Can you actually take a blood sample? And can you do something that will help diagnose Alzheimer's disease? And he said, well, how are we going to sort this out? So he enrolled the help of Dr. Albert Kuhlman here in the University of Cambridge. And he said, will you do that again? And can you tell me what's the difference in serum levels in people with Alzheimer's disease compared to controls? So Dr. Kuhlman went off and he did, again, very exotic work somewhere and, and using very exotic techniques. And he found that, yes, serum samples in people with Alzheimer's is different, but he didn't replicate the findings of Mark Mapstone. So he found, he found differences, all right. But one of the big differences was that the serum samples of people with carotenoids were low in EPA and omega-3 fatty acids. So the story continued. So we, shortly after that, we had a meeting in Waterford. And the, when people are enrolled in a trial and they get given a supplement, the supplement continues. So as, as goodwill or whatever, the supplement will continue for the people who had Alzheimer's disease, who had improvements in vision. And Dr. Howard said, well, what happened to them? What happened to those people who've continued on with the carotenoids? And then he said, well, we should also, we should, if they're short in omega acids, we should divide these now into two groups. And with one group, we should give carotenoids and omegas omega-3 fatty acids, and in the other group, just give carotenoids and see what happens. And, and, you know, those of us sitting around the table going, OK, OK, well, we'll go and do this now, but these are people with established Alzheimer's disease. So this was the third study. Um, and this is the paper that is a, a bit like um, our previous speaker just said, to tell the, tell the good news at the start. But what were we able to do combining um, omega-3 fatty acids with carotenoids. So again, the objective of the study was to, uh, to investigate the impact of carotenoids plus omega fatty acids. Really, we wanted to see the biochemical response. What would happen to the blood levels of carotenoids if you combine them with a substance that we had now proven was missing? But we were going to do a little bit of other stuff as well because as we were doing the study. So trial one, so trial one, just remember, this is a group of people who had Alzheimer's disease and they were given carotenoids on their own and they had a clinical assessment at baseline and then carer reports on how they are doing 18 months later. Trial two was a similar group, 13 patients with established Alzheimer's disease and they were given carotenoids and omega-3 fatty acids. And what happened? This was the big what happened. Well, a couple of really interesting things happened. So the first thing was we found that if you look here, the green line is people who have Alzheimer's disease who are taking carotenoids only. Well, if you look here, the people who are taking carotenoids and fish oils had a hugely increased level of serum lutein. So there seemed to be some synergistic effect that by giving omegas, with the carotenoids, you managed to hugely improve the absorption of it. Now, I could put up exactly the same slides for the other carotenoids, but this illustrates what I'm saying, is that you can, giving carotenoids on their own to controls or people with Alzheimer's will certainly increase your serum lutein, but combining with omega fatty acids, there was a significantly improved absorption. And why? Well, what did that mean? And we were very excited about that. And then. Again, Dr. Howard said, well, can you go back and actually go back and ask about all those people and what's the story? What's the story with the patients? So one of our research nurses independently contacted all of the people in the study. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> so for trial one, trial one was the people who got carotenoids only. A lot of them had really deteriorated, you know, the same, too sick to continue in the study, in a nursing home, unable to continue, unable to follow instruction, too sick to continue in the study. So really, a lot of the people just simply couldn't continue. 
their Alzheimer's disease had progressed because, as, as I said at the very start, this is quite a relentless condition. It does go on. <clears throat> but trial two, the story was actually significantly different. And I don't think I'm probably the most surprised person in the room at that finding. I just thought, no, this isn't going to happen. But actually, it did. There was an improvement. So good improvement in memory, good improvement in memory and sight, improved mood, the same, good improvement. So a very different story by giving carotenoids and omega-3 fatty acids. So what had happened? We'd got the absorption of the nutrients better. We know those nutrients meet the eye. We know they go into the frontal lobe. We know they go to parts of the brain that are important. So now what? So now what we have to do is we have to go and do it all again and do it with much bigger numbers. But that's good science. We now, we have really exciting preliminary data. Let's go and do good science. So good science, and we have Stephanie here who's going to run our Remind trial. So she's now going to get people with established Alzheimer's disease, and we're going to be much more specific on looking at cognitive outcomes, functional outcomes, activities of daily living outcomes, because remember, Alzheimer's disease is not memory alone. It affects other domains as well. So this study is now starting and we're very excited because people want to be part of it. So we have people who are now coming in saying, actually, can I, would I be able to go into that study? And of course, because this is the way that we will get the answers that we want. We also have a fantastic study ongoing called CARES and Rebecca is here and, and a CARES study is actually looking at giving people omega-3 fatty acids and carotenoids at mild cognitive impairment. So mild cognitive impairment is not Alzheimer's disease, but it is where there's functional changes in memory. So there are changes in memory, but they haven't trouble with their activities of daily living, etc. We want to know if you give it earlier, will this, have a, will this reduce progression to Alzheimer's disease for those that would go on to do so, about 10 to 15% per year. And again, Rebecca's doing really beautiful work because mild cognitive impairment, it, it, they're extraordinarily difficult to get. I know there's supposed to be lots of them out there, but they're difficult to get if you're going to do it properly. So she's doing great work at being very specific that we have the right people and is doing all sorts of fantastic things. So let's talk, my final thing, let's talk nutrition and let's talk exercise. So we need, we need to, as, as a world population, we need to take nutrition and exercise, we really do need to take it seriously. And that's what this group is about. So we were talking yesterday, if you take a, is it a cup of broccoli, I'm going to, a cup of broccoli every day, and you do it every day, you might get in enough. But, but you don't, and my, my, my sons won't eat anything green unless it's disguised. So you play Houdini with the vegetables, trying to get them in. To get, but I know they're not taking in enough. But we must, we simply must, and we talked about mild cognitive impairment, but when should we be giving all of these things? Should it be in, for somebody like me? Should it be for somebody who's doing their PhD? Should it be for somebody much younger? Let's take nutrition seriously. And that's what this group is doing now. They are getting nutrition. And because I uh, always talk about exercise, I have to put exercise, nutrition and exercise, that's where we have to be. That's where it's all about. So the journey ahead, um, I wore the dress, particularly because of the marigold flowers, you know, we can, get, we can get the carotenoids, we can get the constituents that we know are of benefit, and we can get them. We know how to get them. The, the, the technology is there. We can get our fatty acids. And there's a great big journey ahead, but it's a really exciting one. It's a really exciting one. And the important thing is not to stop questioning. Curiosity has its own reason for existing. So we do find these fantastic things. I am one of a big research team who have disappeared off the slide for whatever reason. Anyway, I have, I have addressed most of them. I suppose I particularly want to address uh, Professor John Nolan, who is, is just, he's at the top of all of this research and he's just such a fantastic leader and should be extraordinarily proud of himself in this. So as Aldo, Albert, Einstein, uh, Albert, Albert Einstein said, I have no special talent, I'm only passionately curious. But we need to be passionate about Alzheimer's disease. This is a condition that makes people lose their sense of self and we can help. I think by doing all of this, we can help. Thank you. So this session's open for uh, questions. Uh, we may have time for just one, maybe two questions. Um, hello, I'm uh, Alan Howard, and I had my photograph up there recently. <laughs> uh, I think it's important that it's very important that the study should be repeated outside Waterford, outside Ireland, by different people. 
Now, if you're at all interested, and I hope you are, would you please let us know about it by writing a note to, <coughs> to John Nolan saying, I'm interested in a repeat remind. And then we'll contact you and try and arrange groups of people who might be able to continue the work. That's it. Thank you. Thank you for the uh, excellent lecture. Um, the finding about omega-3 apparently increasing absorption of, of carotenoids certainly is surprising. Um, my only comment there is, uh, you know, serum is a transient tissue, uh, so we can't necessarily assume that absorption is increased unless we really test it. It, it could be turnover. It could be the fact that it's not getting into tissues. Uh, you know, you did see increase in macular pigment, but uh, you can't necessarily assume it's uh, an increase in absorption. I think, uh, sorry, <laughs> I mean, should I comment back on that? I, I absolutely, absolutely, I think you're right in that serum is a transient. However, these were a subsequential um, testing and it remained high in the mall, but absolutely, absolutely. Can, can we show, is it if you have it much higher in your serum, are you getting much more of it in the eye, much more of it in the brain? I suppose that's why people like Bubu in his presentation yesterday, where they're actually looking at brain samples, this is the, this is the proof of the pudding, isn't it, that you can actually see increased levels at target, target organs, yeah. Uh, great, great talk. Um, you showed us clear endpoints and, and uh, nice effects. Uh, how much is known about the mechanism behind this on the molecular I'm sorry, level? Can you repeat the, the question? The mechanism. Uh, how, how does this work? How, uh, how do carotenoids, carotenoids work? Yeah, like so in, it's, uh, on, the, um, on the brain effects. I, yeah, well, well, I'm hoping that Dr. George Perry will tell us an awful lot more about um, I'm looking to you to answer this question, but, but we, 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 know, we know that the brain has huge antioxidant activity. We know there's huge oxygen turnover huge production of oxygen-free radicals, and we know that carotenoids are potent antioxidants. So somewhere along that cascade, carotenoids are working. What part are they working in? So maybe they're working at the synaptic membranes. All of that really needs to be elucidated further, but I think it's predominantly through their antioxidant activity. And if you reduce antioxidant activity, do you also reduce inflammation? Therefore, do you also reduce protein production? So there is a cascade of events that if you have potent antioxidant activity, it's going to help. Correct. Absolutely. So, so these were two groups of people who were, were um, contacted individually by the research nurse. So you're right in that there wasn't a specific cognitive testing on the patient themselves, really because we didn't expect it to be different. I think that's the important thing. We didn't expect the groups to be different. But clearly in Remind, we have to be much more specific now on cognitive, functional, and, and um, other, other outcomes. So, so when you said No, so I, so I actually put up the tables exactly as you saw there. So those words are the words that the people used to the nurse. So we didn't alter them in any way. Okay. So, so at least if, if you remember in the group who got omega-3 fatty acids, they were saying, well, actually, they're better, and their mood is better, and they're managing better. And for whatever reason, they're significantly better. So did, did you when I'm using the word significantly, I'm using the word that the carer would have used. Okay. Thank you.
theory of the UK free law that the response may be, if we make that assumption, that was the significant significance uh, when you have the immediate threat. Thank you. I think. We may only have, in the interest of time, only um, time for maybe one question or comment, so we can stay on track. Sorry. Yeah, I don't think I'll be able to illuminate uh, the action of carotenoids, except to say that there, it's really a dramatic effect you've had, because people have tried uh, antioxidants, vitamin E, a number of things, mm -hmm. and have seen actually no results. Sure. This is the first really promising results. Mm -hmm. and. Uh, there are indications that antioxidants I won't present, like conditions like gout, which is the accumulation of uric acid, reduces Alzheimer's disease by 75 percent. So there are indications that strong antioxidants do have an effect. And your, your data, together with the fatty acid data, really suggests that this may be a therapeutically valid point to um, intervene. Absolutely. And we need bigger numbers. And that's why, remind, Stephanie, your work is cut out for you. Remind is going to go ahead. Okay, thank you. Thank you thank so you. much. Actually, I have, can I just explain why I had the orange? <laughs> so somebody said yesterday about about reduced our uh, reduced uh, reaction time, and they showed a goalkeeper. Well, I was at a, a talk once where somebody had an orange and they threw it into the audience. So I had fully intended throwing an orange at Professor Nolan, but it didn't 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 work out. Thank you very much.